Well, I'll start talking to John, and then Denny will, will join us. He is here, by the way. I actually literally did a sighting of him. Um, John, while I have you here, this is quite an a, a incredible um, adaptation you've done, um, a challenging book to adapt. Um, you, you know, can you tell us your approach? I was fascinated by the fact that you relied on the f family dynamics to draw us in, and then uh, the, the script spills from that. Uh, can you talk about that? Dune is an extremely challenging adaptation for several reasons. One is about sheer magnitude. Uh, it's a 700-page novel, dense with world building and lore um, and intricate rule systems of its own. And there was a pitfall there. A movie could easily founder trying to explain and lay out and play out all of those rules and all of that world building. And there's nothing in any of that by itself to engage the heart, only the mind, and to feel the film the way it needed to be felt. Uh, we needed to to make the audience feel and love three people, a mother and a father and a son, who live at the center of this film. And it is their experiences, their richly rendered internal experiences, that is the stuff of the novel, Dune. And if we could somehow impart, through the tools of cinema, the interior lives of those three people and let the audience feel how much they loved one another, how fiercely they were fighting to save the family, to save one another under dire circumstances, then the movie would succeed with audiences. But it all relied on that, to render and to feel these three people. Um, but, what, oh, here it is, Denis Villeneuve. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Denis. Thank you, thank you. I apologize. That's all right. I deeply apologize. The truth is, I was having a sandwich in the garden here, <laughs> and I have an excuse. I'm from Montreal, it's November, it looks like paradise here, and I, 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 we totally didn't look at the time. So my sincere, uh, thank you. I'm sure, anyway, John is much more interesting than I, I am. So. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're both equally interesting. <laughs> um, um, Denis, my question to you is, the, you, you don't rely on special effects uh, to draw us in. There's a lot of natural light. Um, it, it, it feels like cinema, um, you know, when we're drawn into the story. Can you tell us about that choice that let's not rely a lot on special effects? And uh, the first, the biggest special effects is, is, is John here. I mean, it's, it's like the screenplay. I mean, uh, we spent the, the, the biggest challenge for this movie was screenwriting. And to uh, uh, find that people are really often asking me about how did I reach the equilibrium between intimacy and scope. And that equilibrium had, had to be found in the screenwriting, of course. And, and uh, that's the, the first thing I will say. Uh, and then uh, how did I translate to the, uh, I, did, I put a lot of focus on nature uh, uh, as a uh, why, because it, it's for me, and I think uh, uh, for John too, is, uh, nature is a the very, uh, is the soul of the book. It's like at the center of the, the, the book has been written from an observation uh, uh, on uh, biologic, uh, environmental uh, experiments, scientific experiments. So it was, uh, Frank Herbert was inspired by those experiments and, um, so nature is, for me, at the forefront, is at the center of the story. And I try to bring nature, uh, the power of nature, on screen as much as I, as I could as a filmmaker. That's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And going back to the script, uh, John, the fact that, um, that it, you, it's, it's, it's very complex, but you never talk down to the audience. Like, the, the balance where you explain things, but at the same time, there's other stuff that it's like we as an audience need to catch up. Does that make any sense? Find, finding that balance um, in the script. Exposition is a challenge in every film. Um, and in science fiction and fantasy in particular, there are extra burdens because you have to describe and explain the world to people. 
um, and they don't automatically understand a restaurant, a taxi cab, uh, a city street. All of those things work by different rules. Um, in this world in particular, the world building is very profound. Um, and so you look for those precious moments where people do say things to one another that they might already know. In arguments, for example, it's very common uh, for us to restate things that we know and to shout at one another. And there's a precious gap that you can force a little bit of explanation into. But wherever possible, um, the best world building in cinema is done cinematically. And a thing Denis said to me very early on when we were sitting down to work together, and I should say when it comes to script, um, not only was Denis deeply involved in my process as a collaborator and just sharing thoughts on story daily as I was working, but he has also done a lot of script work on his own as a, a very fine writer in his own right. So he is very much you know, uh, to blame and to take credit for all of this. Um, uh, so much of what is wonderful in this script is him. Um, but he said to me very early on that his ideal Dune, his platonic ideal, would be a wordless film, a film told purely through the language of cinema and image, which is a daunting glove to throw down um, when you're talking about one of the wordiest books in science fiction. <laughs> and moreover, a book that gives you a constant window into the interior processes of people. You hear them thinking all the time. Um, and that is not a lens that is available to a filmmaker. And so we needed to find a cinematic language that could convey those meanings and those truths uh, without a pipeline into the minds of those characters and without filling the screen with talk. Um, Denny, one of the things I, I, I loved about this film, being a foreigner coming to the United States, the fact that this young man, Paul, finds his identity through another culture um, was so freaking appealing to me watching your film. Is that something that lured you into? Uh, at the very beginning, when I read the book, I think that in, re uh, in retrospect, when I, I'm thinking about what really touched me about that book was this idea that uh, someone at a very young age, as a, the, so a young character is building his own identity, will uh, find solace and, and, and uh, um, comfort and, and uh, uh, find himself finally complete in contact with another culture. That's something that uh, uh, I was like, uh, uh, deeply touched me. And that's why uh, with John, we insisted in the idea that Paul, it would be necessary to feel that Paul is a, is a curious uh, student, someone that wants to learn about the Fremen culture. That, that, that curiosity uh, will allow him in the future in the story to uh, adapt to this world. He will survive because of his uh, curiosity and, and his appetite to learn about more about this other culture. The idea that another culture can be the solace, the, 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 the bring ease, bring peace, is something that is, uh, I thought is beautiful in the book. Yeah. Um, and John, we talked about the foundation of the family dynamics to lure us into the story, but then the, the themes of uh, colonialism and the environment and and you know female empowerment they're all there and they're really intense themes um how was it for you balancing all the the strong themes of the story well it's again the character that makes the the storytelling possible um Denis decided very early on that we wanted to wed our sensibility as viewers of this film to the experience of Paul Atreides. And so we follow him very closely through the film and his emotional experiences are our emotional experiences. And therefore the journey of his character lends a natural cadence to the exploration of these themes as he one by one has to grapple with the jeopardy his family is in and the ways in which his family may be morally complicit in a corrupt system. They are arms of imperialism, even if it is against their will. Um, he sees the Fremen as a downtrodden people and comes to know their circumstances more and more intimately as the film plays out. And so with him, we 
feel the impact of imperialism and of colonialism there. And as his life comes to hinge more and more desperately on the ability to survive and to flee into the desert and stay alive there, then he is living the ecological drama of the story and he is seeing that there are people who have learned to walk this knife's edge and to live in a place that seems in all ways inhospitable to life. And so Paul's character experiences lead us through the great thematic ideas of the story organically. But um, and to, to the two of you, the fact that the film feels so modern and so urgent, the themes, I mean, the, the, and, and Frank Herbert wrote this in the, you know, years and years ago, but all the ideas that he's dealing with feel so contemporary right now. So is that something that you guys punctuated or it was all along in the original, in the original story? I think it was not necessary to lend emphasis to those things. I mean, the sad story about why the novel remains current. Um, I mean, th there's a, a meaningful way in which Frank Herbert dodged a lot of bullets by eliminating ordinary science fiction tropes from his story. There are no ray guns and fighter jet battles in space and so forth. And so the movie feels timeless because in his universe, it is the human powers that are prime the physical ability of warriors, the mental acuity and perceptions of human minds, like that is what makes this story tick. It is a human scaled story. But the reason the novel still resonates today is because the evils that were abroad in the earth when Herbert was writing are still abroad in the earth and in some ways have done more damage since. Yeah, the, the, the book is sadly more relevant today than it, it was, I think, when it was written in the, at, uh, at the beginning of the 60s. It's quite fascinating to hear uh, Frank Air Burton is in the, some interviews talking about climate change at the end of the 60s, you know, when he was urging uh, the politics to, to change about the way we exploit the natural resources and, uh, and our relationship with nature. I mean, he was ahead of his time. And uh, yeah, the book is. So to answer your question, I think that uh, the, those thematics are in the, in, in the book. I think that what uh, Eric, John, and I try to brought up to the surface, or maybe was as for those who knows the book, it's a very masculine book, but there are seeds of feminism in in the book. It's present. It's there. It's beautiful. And 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 uh, um, Frank Herbert was really someone that was in love with femininity and the strength of femininity. And there's something that uh, we the movie we brought up by uh, um, giving Lady Jessica her proper uh, um, a space in, in, in the storytelling, trying to, that, to, bring, to put the emphasis on, on, uh, on her character and the Bene Gesserit, which are elements, which are my favorite elements uh, of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to my question, D Denis, if you don't mind expanding about the whole look of the film where you know the the emphasis on on nature and even in the design where it's natural lighting um, everything is feels just grounded uh, visually like like it almost feels like history but but like it, the book again the book was the Bible I, I always refer to the book it's true that uh, uh, the designer the team that uh, work on the movie the the, the the idea was to go as far away from fantasy as possible and to try to bring the movie closer to what will be like uh, art sci-fi, uh, if such a thing is possible, to try to ground uh, the vehicles, the architecture, and the logic of the where they are placed in the ecosystems. All we, we designed the movie all in relationship with the environments and the impact on the environments, how the people will live for real on Arrakis. Uh, uh, the idea was to tried almost to have some kind of documentary feeling about um, and that every, everything will have a, a, a purpose, a reason. The, the way the, the, the city has been designed is really in relationship with the harsh condition of the weather and the desert and the wind, et cetera, et cetera. And the same for vehicles. It was always trying to ground things in the laws of physics, gravity, so it will look, feel as real as possible, as does the book, as does the book, because it, the book, when you read the book, the way Frank Herbert described the ecosystems, the relationship between human and nature, 
the, the la faune, uh, animals, uh, the living things. It's so precise, it feels so real, it's so grounded. It's something that seduced me deeply when I was, uh, um, when I read it uh, at 13 years old because I was uh, in love with biology. And, and uh, so I wanted to, to protect that and to try to do the movie in the same spirit as the book was written. Um, visually, take further uh, what you were talking about, I was, I, I was observing that when we're in the desert is handheld camera and uh, the ratio changes when we're in calendar. Um, it's all like tableau, almost like painter-like visuals. You know, can you talk about the, that dichotomy? Uh, Greg Fraser and I, when you design each movie, you will try to approach the movie according to what the meaning, uh, the purpose of the, uh, the inspired by uh, the screenplay. We, um, we thought that, uh, first of all, it would be very interesting to approach the desert in IMAX. I was, I was really dreaming uh, uh, this movie in uh, 143, like, almost like an old movie format. There was something about the intimacy of that format. Uh, for me, IMAX is, um, when I, I did some work with IMAX in the past, I, I realized that it's a format that enhances intimacy. You, you are like so close to the character that it's like when you are very close to a human being and you go in, uh, inside the bubble of that human, there's something about in the, it's an increased intimacy with, with the characters. And at the same time, it, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an IMAX screen to convey the, the power of, a, of a, the impact of a landscape. And uh, the movie being an exploration of uh, this impact on a young man's soul as he's going deeper into a landscape. The deeper he goes into the landscape, the deeper he goes into himself. And we were trying with the camera to uh, reproduce that feeling. So at the beginning, when his world is very stable, it's we went for tableau, very, very quiet camera movement, where everything is like, a, and the, the more his world uh, is getting dis disintegrated, the more uh, the pulse world is getting destabilized. The 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 the, fr the more free the camera uh, becomes, the, the more he, he he gets closer to to a part of himself, getting deeper deeper into his his uh, his um, journey. Um, the the more he becomes free, so the, the camera again became uh, uh, out of tripod. So technically, what you see is that uh, everything at the beginning is is tableau, and when we go into the desert with our IMAX and 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 held, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it was it, uh, listen. We had we, it was the first time I was trying with uh, I was working shooting in, uh, uh, with camera that for IMAX, and it was a way to try to find um, to keep that impact when you change the framing in IMAX. It's, it's quite uh, interesting. It's it's like a new tool to express um, going to from 235 to IMAX suddenly. So it's uh, deserts and dreams are in IMAX. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to, to take it even further, if you don't mind talking to us about the color coding in the film, um, you know, for example, when we're in Kaladar is more greens, and by the time we get to the desert, I notice that even the, like, the sky is not blue, it's, it's white. And, and but there, was a, there was an idea to, to try to go away from um, postcards and, and uh, the beauty of nature, but to embrace its power. And, and for Arrakis, uh, I was thinking that if the skies were uh, very harsh, very bright, and, and uh, uh, infused with some dust, and, and, and uh, it was just to show that this world w was brutal, and that the beauty will, will install itself if you stay long enough, but it's at the beginning is just very harsh and brutal, and to create contrast between the planets um, and the color palette. Uh, Impose in, in self. Uh, I think that I try to reach also a, some kind of. It was a very nostalgic uh, movement where I was trying to go back to the source of my love for cinema, where coming from a small town in Canada, I saw a lot of bad prints <laughs> with faded colors. And, and uh, when I, I discovered cinema through television, of course, and the, the, it's, it's like, I remember um, the cartoons, everything with the, the color were faded. 
and I love that so much. And, and, and it's like, uh, I, that's the way I think when I read the book, I dream about the Iraqis at the first time with that kind of... Uh, and, you know, when, when we were... In, I was making jokes at the beginning, but for me, it's, it's a year, your, your world is an explosion of color for me. I'm coming from Canada. Right now, if we all travel together and I bring you in my backyard, everything is gray. It's a color palette from white to gray to deeper gray to... <laughs> depressing gray, you know, it's a really, uh, and, and I'm used to that monochromatic environment. It, in a way, when you make movies, there's things like that that are difficult to explain that are, are coming from deep inside you, and that's the way I was dreaming in Dune, was maybe it's a way to bring it closer to me, mm -hmm. yeah, because it was a book that felt so close to me all those years, yeah. Um, John, you were recently greenlit for part two. Um, how, yes. Yeah. Um, how challenging was it to write a script where you, you don't know if you're going to go ahead and do part two, but you're, you're only doing part of the story? Was that, was that hard or...? We had to proceed on faith that we would ultimately tell the whole story. But at the same time, what was essential was that no one walk into the theater to see this film, either as a newcomer to Dune or a diehard fan of the novel, and walk out again feeling that they had been cheated, that the movie was not complete or that it did not satisfy. So the, the challenging part was to take the first half of this novel and in it find an arc that landed with a sense of completeness and necessity at the end. Um, but there is, I think, waiting for us there in the novel the perfect three-act tragedy of the Atreides family, being drawn into danger, attempting there to survive, seeing things disintegrate and their house burn to the ground, but then um, in a last sudden turn of hope, a seed survives and the house of Atreides does not fall because Paul and Jessica are alive. Mm -hmm. And so in that way we found that arc and it led us to a very natural transition because in the last moments of the film you've just seen, Paul is leaving the world of the great houses, leaving the courts of the Imperium behind, and he is entering the desert and the world of the Fremen. And the second film will play out in that world, and it will be a very different feeling. Yeah, it, I would say that, uh, if I may, uh, John was the architect of finding the right way to end this first movie. I mean, uh, it, it was not something that we found over a weekend. It was a, a lot, a lot of attempt, but John found perfect balance to make sure that Paul's arcs will be completed. And uh, yeah, that's what I want to say. And um, tell us about the casting. Phenomenal acting ensemble. Um, you know, uh, Charlemagne. How did you come? I mean, was he always your? Your, your lead actor, Paul, or, or? I think that I can say, and John, correct me, please, uh, as uh, we were, because Eric uh, Ratz started, uh, wrote a, a draft, I worked a little uh, uh, on the draft after, and John came and, and uh, uh, worked hard and, and uh, to make sure that we land where we are now. And, uh, but as we were working, we were not, at the beginning, not really talking about casting that much. It, we were so much, we had so much on the plate. It was so complex to, uh, to uh, arrive there. And we were just in a relationship with the characters that were coming from uh, our minds. So once the screenplay felt more solid, then we had some talk about the casting, of course, uh, uh, together, because I, I always deeply love to have the screenwriter's uh, opinion about uh, it's always very interesting. Uh, for me, uh, the truth is, uh, uh, Timothée Chalamet was always uh, the the one that came to my mind uh, sp spontaneously when uh, the door opened to do casting. He was um, the one that will be able to embody th that maturity and that youth in the same body. That are those beautiful aristocratic features, the kind of beautiful equilibrium be between masculinity and femininity that I think for me is very Paul Atreides. There's something there that, uh, um, and Timothy, again, is a phenomenal actor. I mean, we see actors like that, um, 
few times uh, uh, in generations is, is really to have someone of that young age with that maturity that can take the, all the pressure of such a big movie like this on his shoulder. And he's a phenomenal actor. One of my favorite passages is the Gum Jabbar box uh, scene. Uh, John, was it what the Charlotte Rampling playing that role is just phenomenal. Um, was that, were you thinking about her when you were writing the part or, or how, did, how did Charlotte Rampling come back? Well, um, like, like Denis, I hosted all of these characters in my mind as living people that I knew because I had read the book so many times. Um, but she is one of the first people who actually jumped out at me as a name and a notion. Um, I know Denis had already uh, worked with her on other projects and uh, talked to her about playing roles. So I think she was always going to be in the mix. I honestly think that she is a singular actress of her generation and that there is almost no one like her uh, for the raw force of personality and exposed intellect that she brings to a role. I'm just saying nothing of the fact that she's played lead roles in three different languages. I mean, she's a terrifyingly formidable woman um, and perfect from Ohio. Um, so, you know, there are many grand dames of acting who I think could have played that role well. Um, but once Rampling came up in the room, it was like her name banished all the other names from that conversation. How difficult, uh, Denny, was it to edit that scene, that box scene? I've seen your film a couple of times, and that 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 Gum Jabbar box scene, editing wise, is is so intricate and such an intense sequence. It's a very good question. I would say so. The scene was very precisely written, but it's a scene that uh, I think I I beaten Joe Walker. Uh, to death, uh, the, yeah, the scene for for my editor Joe Walker was his own gum jabbar. I mean, uh, he had to he, he, to find that uh, uh, exponential curve and to make sure that we were hitting the beats that were explained in the screenplay. And to it was probably the most difficult scene to to edit uh, uh, in the movie. It's a scene that uh, was uh, had many, 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 many uh, recut uh, as uh, we were doing the, uh, to find the structure and uh, if, I can, if I can use the word, uh, the pain orgasm to this kind of uh, exponential, uh, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it, I don't have another word, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it, it's, it's just that it, it it's, and, uh, and I will say that it was also one of the first scenes that I did shoot with Timothy, of course, with uh, uh, Charlotte and, and, and Rebecca Ferguson. And uh, I remember being so relieved when I, I, I did those shots with each of them because casting is always a, you, you do theory, you know, you, you hope it's gonna work, but I remember seeing Timothy uh, morphing, changing, transforming himself, something in his eyes, I was, I, it made me believe that he was suddenly possessed by a force coming out of his subconscious or something. Uh, I was blown away by his performance. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't shoot with several cameras. Uh, yeah, I shot just with, with one, so he had to, all actors are, uh, had to revisit and go back there uh, multiple times. And he, he, was, a, he was a prince. He was, yeah, he really, um, it was a beautiful scene to, to shoot and to cut, but it was a, not an easy process. Yeah. I, as somebody, it's sacrilegious I, to say this. I, I, I've never read the books. I wasn't a fan of Dune. That's it. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I love cinema. And I was blown away by that sequence because it totally captured the scope of the film, the, the, the mystical aspect of it, the, the real stakes, the family dynamics. What was it like, John, for you to write that sequence and then also then to see what Denis was doing editing-wise and filming-wise with the sequence? It's a funny fact about Dune that it is so much a novel of the interior that many of its set pieces, that its most memorable moments, 
are scenes in which the main character must hold extremely still. And literally nothing happens outwardly, and it is in the nothing happening that strength of character is exposed. And we see that when Paul has his hand in that box of pain. We see it again when Paul is ambushed by a hunter-seeker in his chambers, and his stillness will save his life. Uh, we see it again when he's abducted um, and feigns unconsciousness so that his kidnappers don't know that he's listening and hatching a plan. Again and again, people are still, their minds are working. And that's a very interesting thing to try to portray cinematically because you have fewer tools than the novelist to expose that interior life. In Dune, the book, people are thinking right into your ear and you know their every thought, you know where they're looking. Um, the omniscient character of the narrator jumps around and tells you everyone's thoughts. And Denis has only the poetry of cinema which to convey that same story. So the fascinating thing there is how to cut to the essence of that scene, but still create a cinematic experience. It becomes a matter of nuance and fine balance, and that's why this cast was so essential to completing the vision, um, because you can write it as well as you want, but without people giving performances like the ones in that room, your scene won't fly. Um, it's also a pivotal scene in the novel, one of the few, I think, that every person who's read the book could talk about. Uh, it is the opening scene of the novel, um, it is long and operatic, and a number of big ideas are explored in it, and the central action, the needle and the box, stick in the mind. Um, so it was also a scene that made me very aware of the necessity of not letting down the fans, not disappointing the following that this book has. So it was a tightrope walk, but it all comes down to, again, Paul's experience. You know, Many things fell by the wayside in the writing of that scene, many discussions, many ideas hatched in, in the novel. They're not in the film because we follow Paul. And Denis, in editing, went even further there because as, as much as I felt I was cutting the exposition in that scene to the bone, Denis removed it further still and hewed tightly to the journey of Paul through that moment. And I think that's why the scene sings. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, you can. <laughs> um, Denny, another sequence. One, a blue, uh, a blue mic. <laughs> it's because I, when you get good speeches here, you have a blue mic. Yes, yes. It's the reward. When you speak well, you get upgraded. I'm moving up, yes. thank you. You pass. Yeah, that's actually, actually Charlotte rampling on the corner there, handling the microphone. Um, um, Denny, the sequence between Chalamet and Ferguson, the mother and daughter, where they're being chased by the sunworms and, and it was such a visceral sequence, and it looks like it must have been arduous to shoot uh, when they traveled to, um, yeah. Um, can you talk about shooting that, that sequence? You're talking about the moment when they are being chased, both of them, uh, 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 and Rebecca and Timothy, uh, at the end of the, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's very, th th it's, it was all about finding the right worm. Uh, uh, it's not uh, easy to know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, it's OK. <laughs> I know I have to work on that worm joke. Eh? OK. <laughs> the, 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 no, it, it's, it's, uh, the, but it's all about acting again. I mean, it's like uh, we shot that in Jordan. Uh, it was the I will I will say the complexity of it came from the fact that we were trying Greg Fraser and I to we didn't brought lamps we didn't brought uh, artificial light in in uh, Jordan. I think the truth is that we opened one spotlight once for the ornithopter and uh, in the cockpit once. I mean, we just shot with available lights, and I I said them to uh, Greg. I said I would love the nights to feel like. Um, uh, as real as possible, if we are in the desert, we have two m major moons that are giant moons. The, 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 the light would be strong enough to see almost. How can we achieve that to try to f bring that feeling of uh, uber reality? I wanted the desert of Arrakis not to look exotic to the audience. I wanted it to look familiar, that nature feels very dangerous close to us and to our own experience as a uh, Earth people, and um, so we decided to shoot uh, uh, when at dusk, when the, the sun goes down and are in shadows. So to try to create that 
absence of shadows and, and darkness enough to see. But so the challenge was to shoot all those stunts at the pre precise time of the day. So it was time consuming to find that look, that it looks as real as possible. VFX is all about light. Uh, so it's, uh, it was a long, long work, yeah. Um, Does it answer to your question? You know, there was absolutely. no real worm, that's the truth. No, it was, no, you did, you did. Um, uh, the score, Hans Zimmer, is such a stunning score. The, can you tell us where you guys came about the, the sort of voices of women that are chanting and instruments that I, don't, I couldn't recognize in the score? Um, Hans came on board, was the first one I talked to when, when uh, I... I uh, jump into doing this project. I was at the, at the time I was finishing uh, uh, Blade Runner and uh, uh, asked Hans if uh, he knew about the novel. And then he told me it was his one of one or his favorite novel of all time. And it was his, one of his biggest dream to score uh, a move, uh, 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 for Dune. And so he, he um, and from there he, he went totally mad. He, 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 he wanted to create a score. He wanted, to, first of all, to get out of his comfort zone. This project, like John, when he was ri writing the screenplay, or I, when I was directing, it's like, it's a, it's, we are we are having a, a, a hands to a relationship with the book that belongs to childhood. So it's a very, there's something very um, um, important, precious, not the, the right word, uh, um, important, deeply important to respect that childhood dream. So for Hans, he put so much effort getting out of his comfort zone, trying to approach rhythm. He, 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 wants, he said to me that he wanted to go away from any Zimmer trope. He wanted to re reinvent himself. He wanted to, uh, he did create instruments because he wanted the sound of the music to come from another world. And um, very important for him, he wanted the score to embrace uh, 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 feminine power, because for him, as I I I, I do, uh, he was in love with the Bene Gesserit movement and the feminine character. So he he felt that the music should enhance uh, the femininity in the movie, and also um, I'm for spirituality. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's the main thing that the, the I wanted. The, we talked a lot about religious chants that we were. Uh, chanting when we were kids, uh, that beautiful emotion that comes from spirit, spiritual music. It's it's something that we try to have presence in uh, because um, in June nature is the god, and and uh, we wanted to enhance help this idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, the film has I. If you don't mind explaining, the, it was shot digital, but it has a sort of an analog feel to it. How did you, how did you achieve that, that? At the beginning, Greg Fraser and I thought we would shoot the movie in film in 35, and then we did a camera test, uh, beautiful camera test in the desert. Uh, we tested everything, IMAX 35, uh, IRE 65, and the LF, uh, multiple tests. And to my great surprise, I did this test to convince the studio to shoot the movie in 35. <laughs> and when I, I, I look at the test, I say, oh, I'm wrong. It, it, it's, it's, I feel that the movie that I see in myself is, in the, is with the IREC LF, uh, uh, Alexa LF, sorry. It, it feels... Uh, um, not nostalgic, it, it feels more uh, contemporary. It feels like uh, the, it feels close to the, the, the dream I had when I was young. It's, it's very strange. So we decided to go with the LF, which allowed us to shoot for IMAX and uh, uh, the rest. Uh, and it's also a, ca a camera that allowed us to shoot in very low light environment. All the shots at the end of the desert, I think, will have been very difficult to do in 35. So uh, it's uh, the flexibility of the camera gave us more range. Now, once it was finished, we had an idea, Greg and I, was to take that, uh, the, the, the movie once it was graded and then to uh, shoot it in, in 35, did put the negative and put it in a telecine and then re-put re re it, put it back in digital. So to overall, the movie became at that kind of, uh, of um, 
softness that we were looking for on the uh, faces because the movie is really like a dance between very, a lot of close-ups and massive landscapes. And uh, I was tr feeling that the digital was a bit intense sometimes. So at, in prep, we do, do, did those tests where we we um, ask the studio the possibility to do that process that I don't think has been done before. I might be wrong, but uh, the idea to shoot in digital, flip into film, and go back into digital like that. So it gives the old movie that kind of 35 feeling, but with the power of the digital when you go in lower lights. And and, uh, and we were out of time. But you know what happened? The pandemic. So we had suddenly all the time in the world. and. <laughs> We, that's, I will say, uh, in that, that sad moment of pandemic, I had one gift, which was to do the process that I was dreaming of. Yeah. All right. that's fantastic. John, are you now working? Are you started working on part two? Well, uh, Denis obviously is the skipper of that ship. Um, knowing the second half of the book, there's nothing that he can't move forward on. And so visual design and design of that world and design of the story can all press forward. Um, but I, I can I can answer to yes. if you don't mind I will I will help you here. The, it's very very simple our relationship. I start to write the screenplay because it's very important for me to to bring the ideas and the material to close to me, and to find my way into it. And the, the, it's a way I need that process. Then I see the result, I panic, and then I call John. <laughs> That's the first, the way the first one was done, and I'm afraid that this. The first <laughs> <laughs> but it's just I need that moment where, where, uh, uh, um, say the the when we wrote the the the, the first uh, movie, uh, John uh, did a, a road map, of course, to to for the second one. We know what will happen, to, but uh, the, right now I'm in the, the stage of of. of Diving in, and and uh, John will come to my rescue in a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Are you daunted by the idea of, of diving again in this? I'm thrilled about it, and I am daunted in some ways. I mean, on the one hand, there's so much deeply satisfying material in the second half of the novel that it's very exciting to think about getting into it, and it's the much the more challenging half of the book. Uh, where things that were knowable before become unknowable. Um, st strange leaps in space and time are made. Uh, things become more abstract. And uh, stop it, stop it. I'm already <laughs> having a nightmare. No, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more challenging to tell, um, but also very exciting. The great thing is that I think... <laughs> <laughs> it's that bad. Um, <laughs> the uh, the great thing is that in finding the first film as masterfully as he has, I think Denis has given us a syntax that will let us carry forward. We have a cinematic language now um, with which to tell this story, and the choices of the first film will guide the second. And in that way, I feel much calmer, despite the challenges <laughs> in the material, because we have a North Star. There is a film to follow, and I think that will be our guide. Yeah, it will be the first time. Have you ever done that uh, work on, on something that uh, 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 a second part of a? I've never worked on a film and its sequel. Never. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a very interesting process. Yeah, to to know the characters, to know where the the direction, uh, everything uh, has suddenly uh, exist does exist. It's very 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 interesting process. Yeah. Well. Uh, as Zendaya says at the end of the film, this is only the beginning. And we're so fortunate to have had you here today. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a Thank pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I may, I, I just want quickly to thank you all for coming to watch the movie in a theater. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you.